before the revolution happened, uh, the free speech on the web uh, was the way that the citizen were able to, to uh, talk about what's happening daily in their countries. And they used animation heavily to, to present that. But they wanted to keep their anonymity in there, so that's why they used services, nicknames, and things like that. What we witnessed after the revolution, the explode of expression, from political expressions in animation, in talk shows made directly to the web, and in all countries, not even in, in Egypt. You see it in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Morocco, you see it in Saudi, where to, they're talking about political system, they're talking about what's happening as, as in the civil society, and etc., etc. You also see it from companies' point of view, that they saw the interest from the users that are, uh, for what's happening in the region, and they start producing content specifically for uh, users who are looking about the revolution, just talking about what's happening about the leaders, what's happening in the countries, and things like that, addressing each segment. And for the first time we've seen it this year is a, a web show that make it from, was produced with a small budget directly to the web, and now a, a TV station actually bought the rights, and there it, it goes continuing it as a as a TV station and webisodes at the same time. So definitely, what happened during the revolution changed the, the order of the game completely, and and animators and producers are now thinking of a huge medium that they can utilize. For for the new animate, animators that are coming in here, the idea is it's not about producing the high quality 3D type of an effect show. Uh, and at the same time, it's not something that, that's, uh, uh, it's not about the entire, uh, how hard you're gonna work on the show. We have, a, we have a rule at Google, so you either produce things uh, that are scrappy, or you produce things that are top of the shelf. Nothing in between. So as an animator, you need to think about that. Your, your, your idea is, is what matters. It's not about how well you're gonna present it or how 3D it is it's gonna be or things like that. You need to think about it. I'm either gonna produce something scrappy or I'm gonna produce something top of the shelf. So that's the vision that you're thinking about it, uh, when you're doing this. Thank you. Okay, it's, uh, it's about risks, change, and revolutions. Um, these are the, theme, the, the three themes that come to mind. I don't know if any one of you remember the uh, 18th of February? Yeah. Friday? That was what Egyptians called the Friday of uh, victory, which followed the Friday of relief when Mubarak left. That was the first time Sheikh Qaradawi travels to Egypt and has a prayer in the square. I was in Tahrir Square on the day. And I climbed up to the rooftop of Semiramis Hotel, which oversees the square. And I saw for the first time in my life something like two million people. I didn't count them. They could be a little bit less, a little bit more. But I was told that there were two million people in the square there. And what happened there is that there was a situation that needed change, and people took to the street. Now, there, are, there is another way of changing that situation, which is to take risk, to go to, to one of the legacy presidents or kings and to say, by the way, all your ministers are over 70 years old. You know, take some risk. Instead of having Nouri Sharif, who is trusted and tried before and gets me audience, get somebody younger like Mohammed Harib, who's young, but he has some ideas. Now, the legacy ruler would hesitate because I have tried my 70-year-old minister several times. He's durable, he's very good. I use him several times, nothing happens to him. Whatever policy I ask him to do, he does it. Now, with a young guy, it's a little bit risky. Now, it doesn't always work with an attempt at convincing the establishment to take risks because they have to generate revenue and they know that if they have tried a method they can get a return and the return is calculated. Now take somebody new, I don't know how much audience would that generate. So what happened in the region, which is the masses taking to the street and changing things by hand because they know what they want, is happening in a similar way in the media industry. Because people took to the internet, took to the streets. They are talking directly to their consumers. They didn't go and ask or beg anyone to put them on the internet because they have direct access. And some have already tried it. Now the problem is, they did it and they had a response. And as a result, they got the attention of the establishment again. So at the same time, when a couple of people, one of them, I don't know if you have seen him, he did a stand-up comedy to announce his presidential campaign using empty Coke and Pepsi cans as microphones. And he did one of the most hilarious 
presidential uh, uh, pitches to the nation. And I, I saw this and I said, well, this guy's brilliant. I'm going to contact him, we're going to do a show. I ran him in one of the very small villages of Egypt, and as soon as I told him who I am and what I'm interested in, he said, okay, do you want to talk to my agent? Well, I mean, I, you, know, I, you know, I saw your production on the web and, you know, I'm thinking of doing something. It looks like a reasonable cost. You know, I can take some risk with it, but he said, well, I want to do my show. I have already signed with Mr. Tari. I said, who is Mr. Tari? Mr. Tari Moore. He has a channel in Ramadan. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have a show. Look, I am busy. And according to my contract, but I'm happy to pass it to the guy who negotiated the contract for me, I don't think I can appear in any show during Ramadan, but I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. I said, okay, fine, good luck. We'll see how it goes. Thank you very much. Now, I rang another one who is a physician turned presenter who also had a show on the internet that was very good. So I rang him and I said, okay, um, actually, I'm interested in doing something like John Stewart. That's what I would like to do. So my team now is probably something like six, seven, eight people, but I'd like to expand. You cannot do it really with a, a proper set proper casting, writers, researchers, lights, camera, action. So, you know, but the way, you know, what you did was really brilliant. You know, I, I don't think you really need more than that. Now, in both cases, I don't think, and you probably know who I'm talking about, I don't think they managed to get the attention that I think their talent deserves when they change platforms. And I don't think there were any ramifications for, for the two shows because they did not understand the limitations of their platform and the guys who were as interested in them as I was did not understand how they can translate the experience from the internet to TV. So the two lessons from here are, one, do not really wait for the establishment to be convinced of taking risks. It's very difficult. And I was in the TV business before and there are lots of stakeholders that you have to convince. So go to the streets of the internet and make sure that you reach as many people as possible. Now, the second lesson is, when you manage the experience afterwards, don't behave like the old tycoons. Don't do it exactly the same way. Yeah? Young, energetic, creative has to continue to be that case. You have to manage your talent in a much better way, and you have to see how you can reach the masses in the best possible way. Now, if you find a way, if we find a way, because the dynamics of revenue are very different. And I do agree with Muhammad on some things that I don't agree with the others. You know, I do agree with him that really they are like, well, it's very difficult to convince them. But I don't agree that the ultimate goal is to reach TV. It is true that there is more money in TV because of, again, the dynamics of advertising. But the best experience is to be able to reach audiences on a multitude of platforms taking into consideration the limitations around revenue generation. We are talking about click-throughs and you know, few dollars here and there, and we're talking about campaigns of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, we have to find a model that the industry can ad adopt in order to be able to serve the needs of both advertisers, customers, users, and content generators. But I think the wisdom for all of them is to understand the limits and the scope of how things work on the net, on, on the net and how things work on TV, and how we can create that sort of dynamic equilibrium between all of these elements to be able to have a viable, sustainable experience. It's really hard to find to learn animation here. I mean, I find the animation that is being made here is it's very handmade. You know, it's made in like Flash, and people teach it themselves. But if you wait to learn it like properly, you know, the, the rules of animation, the way Disney does it, the twelve principles of animation, and all that stuff. They, they don't teach it here. They only started teaching it in Abu Dhabi, and it's too far for me to go. <laughs> and I, I just wonder what you guys think of that. Um. In regards to animation, as a, again, it's a new field here. It's been here like for what six years, and uh, we're just starting to see that there is a, a huge interest uh, from students. I know that some universities are starting to teach courses in animation. I don't believe it's the right way to go because usually what they do is they teach you on a program, let's say 3D Max or Soft Image or I don't know. That's not how you teach animation. It's the theory of animation. It's the it's actually the art of movie making. Yeah, it's like the whole writing the story, doing the storyboard. So even if you don't study animation, but you end up studying media, and in that course you have, uh, you know, applied media, you go, you film, you do that, you want to tune your skills to be a director.